Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Hybrid Rye Connect event. Um, hopefully you saw our introductory video, uh, Rye Evolution. Uh, we're now going to switch to our main PowerPoint and start our session. So this is entitled Hybrid Rye Opportunities. Um, the main topics we want to relay today, firstly, is why we are considering the crop. Uh, partly due to the agronomics and partly due to the end markets. So I will talk firstly about the drought tolerance of the crop, uh, the rotational income that we can get from the crop, and some of the nitrogen and chemical savings as well. Uh, I'm then going to hand over to, um, to John Miles to talk a little bit more in depth about the, the agronomic work we've been doing uh, with the crop. And then finally, we'll conclude with a little bit on our new products. So about a year ago, we sat down with Cranfield University. Uh, Cranfield have produced a map which shows the soil moisture deficit areas uh, for the UK. And you can see that highlighted in the orange here. This total area comes to around 300,000 hectares which is not insignificant. And that area is the, the key area where um, drought tolerance is becoming more critical. And interestingly enough, Cranfield have told us in the next 10 years, uh, it's gonna get drier. So it becomes even more critical to look at a crop which will consume less water. And so of course with rye, we clearly have a significant saving of around 25%. Um, water uh, water consumption compared to uh, compared to winter wheat. Um, on the rotational income side of things, we also know that farmers, particularly in this area of the UK and elsewhere, are, are very keen to extend their rotation. Um, the time is ripe to look at a, a new crop. And of course, we needed a crop which is significantly mainstream um, to be able to, to combine it uh, and to have an economic yield. So rye, I think we can't really question that it's not productive um, when you look at the yield potential uh, up to about 13 tonnes on farm. This is more in, li in line with about eight to nine tonnes, but in trials, we can uh, really push the yield as John will talk about later. Um, it's a relatively early harvest, but of course it's not as early as winter barley. Um, but it, I think on the other side that helps to spread the uh, spread the workload. We've had a lot of questions about take all. Um, it's not um, it's not fair to say that rye is immune to take all. I think it's very important we're, we're clear on that. But on the other side, uh, it is more tolerant perhaps than than wheat. We also have good black grass suppression and that issue is well known. I think the final area we've seen is the straw yield. Um, straw is becoming quite an important uh, additional source of income for farmers. And so with rye, we can get about 20% higher straw yield than, than wheat. Um, and then on the rotational slots, uh, people have different ideas, different debates about where rye will fit. It could be an option for all seed rape for some. Uh, for those who aren't going to grow all seed rape, it's, it's an option in itself. So then going on to the, uh, the chemistry and the nitrogen savings, uh, when we look at the new agricultural bill and the ELMS uh, scheme, which has been launched, we can see farmers are going to be challenged to find some savings. When it comes to disease, um, the two biggest diseases for wheat, which are septoria and um, uh, rhynchosporium, and then ramularia on barley. We have quite an advantage with rye because it's a, it's a different species. So by being a different species, we are literally reducing our, our direct risk from um, some of these major diseases. We also can afford slightly less uh, expenditure 
uh, on trying to control them with rye. The reason, the technical reason why this is, is really down to the yield components. And um, you can see there at the bottom with rye, you have uh, a far lower um, yield proportion coming from the leaf area compared to wheat. So of course, leaf diseases uh, are, are far less prevalent. And then finally on nitrogen savings, this is um, a growing issue now as to how we can deliver nitrogen savings. But on the other hand, we don't want to reduce our yield. So we need to look at rye with respect to maintaining the yield potential, but actually significantly reducing the nitrogen. So up to 45% reduction compared to uh, second wheat for feed, and 46% compared to second wheat if it's for milling. So those are extremely substantial savings, not only uh, in monetary terms, but also environmentally. And I think that's going to that's going to increase. So on the end markets, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, pigs and also alcohol. And then I'll ask Kirsty to come in to talk on uh, on milling. So this the single largest um, market for uh, for rye grain is for pigs. Um, that's a comparatively untapped market, particularly in the UK. But if you look on what's happening on the continent, and you also look at what's happening in Europe and the US, uh, rye is becoming the default option for pig finishing. Uh, we have two targets for pigs. One is uh, finishers, where we can reduce salmonella, and that's becoming um, really quite a critical issue. And we can also promote gut health. Now, if we reduce the antibiotics used in the pig industry, uh, the topic of gut health is becoming more and more of a, uh, a rising uh, agenda for them. Uh, for sows, this is equally important because we now have issues around um, sow housing to do with farrowing crates potentially being banned. And we also have to increase the colostrum quality uh, when we feed rye, we boost the amount of butyrate, and that actually gives you a higher level of, uh, of colostrum. Uh, the one everybody likes to talk about is whiskey. Um, this is a high value market, but I have to say it's a niche market. Um, the amount of tonnage that we can put to rye is going to be limited compared to pigs. The source of interest amongst distillers with rye is really to do with flavour. So you can create this very spicy, um, earthy sort of texture in whiskey. It's interesting to note the alcohol yield is about 10% less than um, current soft wheat, and it's about 5 to 10% less than spring barley. So it's not, um, it's not without some negatives, but it's really the flavour elements that, uh, that distillers want. So I'll just hand over to Kirsty to talk a little bit about um, milling. Brilliant. Thanks very much, John. Um, so I think, yes, as John's just said, uh, the distilling market and the baking market will have similar similarities, really, in that they are sort of niche markets for rye at the moment. But we, uh, we fully intend to work harder with the UK millers to talk about all the positive attributes rye can offer them. Um, we know that obviously UK millers use rye and to be absolutely honest, quite a few import, import rye flour and if we could convert that into using homegrown rye then that would clearly be a win for the whole supply chain in the UK. So what we're doing over the past sort of few seasons is presenting some information that we've accumulated doing some work with Camden BRI. And essentially what we've done is look at rye not as a 100% blend because obviously you get a very different characteristic of loaf produced there, but look at it as a blended in product into a sort of group one typical white slice loaf that they will be producing. And that's really because one of the questions we always get asked by end users is can you provide a ingredient based around wheat that has a higher fiber? And yes, we could with many years of research, but actually we have something ready made here in rye that can actually increase the fiber content 
of loaves. So we do think it's, it's an important consideration for them to think about in the future. So just quickly to show you some of the work that we've been doing, we've looked at rise and inclusion, as I've said, obviously from 25% right through to 75%, and blended it with KWS Zyat. So here is 100% uh, Zyat uh, producing a white slice loaf, and here is with the 25% inclusion of rye. And we've done a number of trials, and, and what they've actually shown is actually when you include 25%, you don't really disrupt that structure of the white loaf particularly, which is interesting because uh, obviously as you increase the inclusion, the rye will start to have a, an effect on the loaf and make it a lot smaller and perhaps more dense. So in essence, what you're doing is you're adding in a potential fibre source. And what we've done then is to say, well, OK, that, that's great. You can pr actually produce a product, a white slice loaf. But what does that mean in terms of the fibre content? So this is actually a calculation that Camden have done for us. They've looked at two different methods of baking and compared the fibre content from 100% the Zyat, so this loaf here, versus the 25, 50 and 75% inclusions. And what you'll see, although it's a, a sort of basic crude measurement, is actually in the spiral bound, just by putting 25% in, you're actually getting an increased level of fibre into that loaf. A bit more marked, um, you have to go further up in the inclusion rates in the sponge dough method, but actually you are seeing some quite dramatic increases in fibre. And I think it's some quite compelling evidence that they're looking at. So we hope to do more work with this in the future and, um, and you know, with the aim of actually increasing the, the area that uh, UK millers are taking from UK farmers and using it in their products. So I'm now going to pass back to John, I think. He's going to take you through the portfolio we have for 2020. Thanks very much, Kirsty. Uh, so a quick update on our, our product range. Um, the whole emphasis of of the uh, hybrid breeding is to increase grain yield. And we do that by increasing this uh, grains per ear. And you can see quite a dramatic uh, variety or variation in, in terms of uh, grains per ear. The um, nominal term for this we refer to as harvest index. So partly we are increasing this uh, number of grains, but we also need to focus on source strengths uh, to support the higher weight. And so, of course, as these ears get heavier, uh, that becomes more of an issue. So we're selecting for the UK mainly on lodging resistance um, with the premise that the, the grain yield of newer hybrids is increasing all the while. The green on the left uh, refers to hybrids which were formerly uh, just for AD. And you can see that they are uh, taller in in straw height, but actually don't support a uh, particularly high harvest index. We've then decided to shift all of that um, emphasis now to the right in the yellow, where you have these dual purpose grain hybrids. And that uh, for whole crop will out yield the biogas varieties. And it has a second advantage, which is better lodging resistance if we wish to combine to grain. So, of course, it's, it's really quite a win-win in terms of that. Um, the proof of this is in the pudding, if you like, in terms of variety performance. So our newest variety, Serafino, has just come onto the new 2021 descriptive list uh, at 111%. So it's immediately the highest yielding um, candidate. Um, so that's really a, a very good testament to our breeding progress and we have new products which will enter this list in the uh, in the coming years so we're now going to hand over to my colleague john miles and he will talk in uh, some depth about the the agronomic work we've been doing john thank you i um i hope so um so let's just summarise what work we've been doing agronomy-wise on, on rye. The initial work was on biogas. So we were looking at sow dates and seed rates and also PGRs. The summary of that is largely we did find a, sow, a seed rate response with sow date. Um, but obviously as a hybrid product, uh, then that can get, uh, can get quite pricey. Um, in terms of PGRs, we were looking at reducing lodging and leaning 
because some of the feedback, particularly with those early biogas types that were very, very tall, was issues with harvesting, um, particularly, you know, direct cutting. If there was a, a lodging and leaning issue, then it really did restrict, uh, restrict the flexibility around uh, cutting the crop. So as John said, this sort of move to uh, more dual type uh, has increased that. And ultimately, with the biogas area plateauing quite a number of years ago, uh, realistically, we then switched into PGR work and looking at making crops more uh, easily combinable. So I'm just going to run you through the work that we were doing uh, uh, last year, but some of the trials have been running for a few years. So we have wheat versus barley versus rye, um, and we have three years of, of data on that. We also had some sodate work, which I think, rather than draw much in the way of conclusions, just shows you how robust rye is. Um, variety trials, seed treatment, and PGR trial. So this was the, the work we've been undertaking. Probably the key one, actually, that's quite interesting is this suitability in a second serial slot. We, a number of years ago, did limited work in a third serial slot. And in that occasion, we found rye absolutely whooped the other crops. Um, and maybe now, you know, with the issues we face with all seed rape, um, a third cereal would be quite tasty in terms of widening that rotation. Um, so in the third cereal slot, we would look for rye to, we would back rye to hands down beat any cereal. But in the second cereal slot, you can see uh, across years, it is no slouch. So these trials are drilled at the same time. Um, we will be drilling at about 180 seeds on the rye and 275 seeds on the wheat and the barleys. Um, the initial years, the, the, the barley and the wheat uh, were receiving differential uh, treatments um, in, in years gone by. But in the last three years, when we've had the rye there, we have treated them the same. So as you can see, you know, they, they, they would have actually had somewhere close to, to 200, 210, 220 kilos of fertilizer on them. Um, and the rye would have had, in the first year, was 150 kilos and is now down to 120 kilos of, of N. The fungicides would have been as per crop. So obviously wheat would have a, a slightly bigger fungicide program. The barleys would still have a three spray program uh, and the rye a two spray program. But we know we've been doing the wheat versus barley work for about eight years now. And the barley still just about pips it. But you do have wheat years and you do have barley years. And as you can see, the thing that's quite striking with the performance of the rye on the PDF at Falmir over the last three years is the consistency of, of yield across that. And yes, we have had, you know, 19 and 18, again, like, uh, like 20, were very, very dry continental springs. I should say as well, within here, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people have um, commented this year about the ability to get fertilizer on early and really supporting the growth. And these wheat and barley crops will have had about 100 kilos of N applied to them by the end of the first week in March. So they, they have been well supported. There's, there's no victim story behind this. And as you can see, yes, we're putting a, you know, pretty much, pretty much two splits on the rye and making sure they're, you know, they're, they're done quite early. So you can see amazing consistency going through here. And then grain quality, again, just in quite interesting because yield is one thing, but consistency of grain quality is always a very good measure of, uh, of a good crop. And you can see here as well, whilst the others haven't done too bad, we've got a very consistent bushel weight coming off of, uh, come of, coming off of here. So we definitely see that, you know, that, that rye in that, in that situation has been a very consistent crop. And obviously, we wait for this year's harvest results. Uh, and whilst the, shop is shot, the crop is shorter than usual, um, it's, uh, it, it's definitely looked a lot less uh, affected by a yet another spring drought than the wheats and the barleys have. I would predict if anybody said, what do you think 2020's results will be? I'm obviously going to say around about 10, 10 and a half tons for the rye. Um, the wheat, I think this wheat could be back at nine tons, even with that early fertilizer. 
I'll be surprised if it's uh, approaching 10. And the barley looks fantastic. So I would imagine the barley will be probably up somewhere close to the rye and the wheat will be back. But again, that would be my estimations on having looked at the plots this year. Um, so obviously it's kind of how do you go about this? Now this is just an example about how we see certain programs or program differences within looking after rye and in highlighted in yellow are the figures that I tampered with effectively. Now obviously as I say this is not a, not a rule but this is just to generally give you the ideas about where changes could be made. Now as a hybrid we obviously have a uh, there's a higher seed cost coming in here so these are just arbitrary figures and some of these largely some of these will be taken from nicks and the ones in yellow i've obviously tampered with for simplification then let's just call a kilo of nitrogen and what a pound so you know second feed wheat around about 240 the barley a lot of people don't still put enough fertilizer on barley but we would be putting 200 in those trials and obviously yeah, we're down at 120s now but i put 150 in for the for the rye on the price differentials we yes you could argue about this um but they are still trading at a, a deficit to to wheat by some degree um but uh, in terms of this this calculation looking at variable costs uh, that's sort of irrelevant um uh, fungicides again some of these figures will be based on nicks um because there's many, many, many ways to, to skin a cat. But ultimately with rye, you know, we don't have the, um, the very bad, I was going to say appalling, we don't have the bad brown rust that we had uh, with some of the initial varieties. So realistically, we are just looking at, you know, triazole, strobe type programs to just control rust. And certainly what, what we've seen before is, you know, you need to get in early to make sure the rust doesn't get embedded because once that starts to grow and the canopy becomes very big, then you will not clear out an infection that you would have had. And that was certainly the experience with the biogas crops. Obviously, we're going to have to do a better job because if we're going to take this all the way through the season till maturity, we do need to make, a, 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 you know, make sure we do a good job on any potential rust. And as John Illis uh, said earlier, you know, there are bits of Rinko that we've seen in crops, but at, a, at, a, at the moment, the seed levels are incredibly low within rice so rust would remain the one significant target insecticides are just across the front here i think it's worth saying rye has a lovely uh, autumn habit uh, our danish colleagues will be starting to drill rye second of september um, quite happily and i think if we had clean land we could do the same um, obviously there are challenges when it comes to um, herbicides and stacked residuals you know and, and again that's a, that's a bit of a can of worms but if you had clean land you know uh, that then then that is a quite a, a doable thing and in terms of BYDV rye is one of the least affected uh, crops and also being such a, a vigorous plant type it really does grow away from infection my one comment I do make here is and this is based on the, the sort of the conversations around biogas crops initially but also this is the motivation for the work to grain crops is, you know, again, based on NICS figures, you know, we're 20 odd pounds in NICS on, on, on PGRs for the, these crops. I would argue rye, we, we do need to make sure rye stays, stays standing. Now on very light land, you know, you look at some of the recommendations from uh, Jordan's Rye Vita, they are using big rates of PGR and they are bringing the crop back to almost a near of a tall wheat site. As we look to expand rye onto heavier land, and obviously where people were using it for biogas, they were getting digestate and are looking at a black grass scenario as well, we were going on heavier land. Now the experience was if you had a bit of a lean, that wasn't positive. Now rye, as you'll see, is a, is a bit of a vigorous crop and the PGR rates need to be robust if you're going to do a job. So I, in some cases, would be higher than that, but notionally I'd put that in as a higher cost than some of the other crops. But I would balance that with the argument that we are making savings on fungicides that I think we would then invest on there. And if we sort of use those figures across the yields that we've had, you can see a very, very consistent uh, financial performance from rye. 
And I think with the uncertainty going forward, you know, a consistent performance that you can bank on is, is something of value. So just to give you a flavor of the work, um, the initial work here, so this is the 2018 work. And you can see we had a play with quite a lot of PGR regimes, some legal, some not legal. Um, but the idea was, the idea behind this one was, what, what will people have in the shed? What products will people be using on, um, on wheat and barley? And then being able to just roll this concept onto wheat. So you can see that we had, we had some clomaquats only, which is not where we'd be. But then obviously looking at the next segmented products like Medax, Clomaquat modus, which I think is fair to say the basis of a lot of PGR applications, and then the use of canopy as well. And uh, so, yes, yeah, quite a big trial. You can see in terms of height differences, very little in it. Um, you've almost got a bounce back here, the Clomaquat only. <clears throat> now, the, we do see height differences at various points throughout the season. But ultimately, by the time the ears are fully out and flowering, those height differences disappear. But ultimately, you can see however much we tipped on, <clears throat> there isn't a significant impact in, in height. The yield is perhaps quite interesting. You can please note here some rather large error bars. Um, whilst there may be trends in a slight reduction in yield due to the use of PGRs, they are not statistically significant. So it was interesting in terms of uh, uh, interesting in terms of kind of you know you see something there's a slight trend but <clears throat> it's not actually there uh, uh, statistically and we have had other trials with other distributors and things where we've been looking at PGRs and we haven't really found I think a clear thing the key thing is 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 lodging and leaning and risk prevention so the 2019 trials. Uh, again, we obviously uh, we obviously try to change this up a bit, the, and we've changed it up again this year. So these are late September sown. The PDF is a fertile but light site. Um, the key aims here was, can we hurt rye? Is there a detrimental impact of too much PGR? Can we overcook it? And you'll be able to see with some of these uh, not recommended rates here, you know, we were using some very big amounts of modus and things. So not necessarily to give advice, but really, as I've always described it, to find the cliff edge. And uh, we worked with uh, uh, other people on some of this as well. The other thing is this straw height. Now, John said about the value of the straw, but we do need a crop that can be combined quickly and efficiently. Um, and also, can we uh, create a split canopy and, and can we see anything with senescence? Does lower seed rate. Now, the lower seed rate in here was because the you know, Danish colleagues thinks, think we're mad. Well, to be fair, we think they're mad. But ultimately, this seed rate is, is, is probably quite high. And if you were in Denmark, they would be drilling about 120 seeds, 100 seeds, uh, second week of September. So realistically, if we did end up coming back to good seed beds, good drill timing, and 150 seeds, then, then, then we need to see if there's a difference. So that was the aims of the trial. Um, and then obviously this sort of two applications. Ultimately, anybody who's grown rye will know that this T1 timing, uh, this T0 timing, and this T1 timing can be very close together. So it's sort of academic that we're doing this because we're trying to put big rates of PGR on. Um, ultimately, will that actually happen in practice? Um, I don't really know. This year's trial, we've gone with just T1s and T2s um, because, of, uh, because of this sort of mm, not sure about t naughts actually getting done. But as you can see, this sort of three spray programs as well as the two sprays. So if we just look at the uh, impacts of height again, um, pretty much backs up what we've learned before, which is not a lot, <laughs> to be fair with you. Um, there were at ear emergence timings 30 centimeters of height difference between the lowest and the highest treatments. Modus.
Cool. Everybody hear me okay? Kirsty John, thumbs up, thumbs down. Cool. Sorry. Something happened with the network. Um, but as you can see, as I was saying, there was 30, 30 centimeters of height difference um, during the growing season as the years emerged. And ultimately, it all disappeared. And you can see the impact on the back tillers here as well. Um, we have got a difference between back tillers. But the use of PGR, I don't think there's a significant trend. You could argue the more PGR might have pushed our, um, our back tillers a little bit further down. But interestingly, the same trends are not really there when we're at 100 and 150 seeds, really. So again, rye seems to grow through the PGRs quite happily. The key thing is, is the impact on yields and the lodging risk. We did have a look at maturity. Um, but I don't think there's any clear pattern here in terms of increased PGR use. And as you can see, there's probably very little. It's a very tight score um, here. So I don't think there's any impact on the maturity of using different PGRs. And as a lot of you will know, the season is going to have the key effect on that anyway. If it doesn't rain, it'll all die quicker. The leaning, we haven't had lodging in our trials, unfortunately. Um, but we have had some leaning. Now, the, I've used the same sort of score as the recommended list. So uh, leaning is from um, 90 degrees to 45. Let's go that way, John. So they're down to 45. That is classified as leaning. And anything beyond is, is, is lodging. So you can see with these yields that we were getting, we were getting some uh, leaning, significant leaning in the plot. Um, at point 0.2 of modus. Obviously, when we step to point 0.4 of modus going in there, we have reduced the leaning quite significantly. And we can see this again with the 150 seeds. But obviously, that is uh, not, uh, not uh, recommended. Uh, 0.8 of modus is not, not a rec label recommendation. Um, but realistically, if we look at this box here, which is what is going to be uh, potentially legal, or is legal, sorry, and could be a field rate, would be the Serafinos with the 0.2 of modus uh, in the Clormaquat followed by a Terpal or followed by a Medax. And we can see the Medax is pretty strong and having a better effect, a better reduction in the lodging and the leaning, sorry. But both of these are significantly better than this. And interestingly, we can see this on the 150 seeds. So this pattern here at 200 is exactly the same as the 150. So we aren't seeing a reduction in 50 seeds. but probably wouldn't have expected to see see that anyway. Um, yields, as you can see here, we were pushing nearly 11 tons a hectare. And you can see that whilst there does appear to be a trend, let's split out the 150 seeds. Um, you can see, again, these rather large error bars. So none of this is statistically significant. Um, but you can see maybe you could argue there is a bit of a drop in, in yield. but. For a, <clears throat> for a standing crop, then that is probably a, a, a very small price worth paying. But we are not seeing a significant impact of PGRs on yield. Uh, and just before I finish the SODATE trials, uh, this is a bit scrappy, I think, to be fair. So please um, don't draw conclusions to this. Uh, but uh, we can see here, so we were drilled on the 13th of September. We did seem to have a bit of a drop in yield. And so funnily enough, the 5th of October has popped up with some of the highest yields. Um, have we seen an impact in seed rates here? Not really. Not Nothing that I think I could honestly pick out. There wasn't uh, any significant lodging or, or any significant leaning. So realistically, I think, as you can see, I mean, the conclusions are, in terms of the agronomy for rye, it is a very robust plant type. And its ability to compensate from either low seed densities or in dry springs, or indeed when it's hit pretty hard with PGRs, you know, its ability to compensate is probably second to none. So I think it's probably quite robust in terms of what we do in the field. But we are seeing not new news that the more PGR you use, the more standy uppy it seems to be. Um, so yes, there are some questions coming in, but I'll let perhaps John um, 
do you want to summarize? Do you want to chair this, John, and do the questions, or do you want me to pick them off? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, everyone, for your contribution. So um, what I'll do is split the questions up a little bit. Um, so firstly, from Tom Sanderson, is which variety would you recommend best for AD, looking at maximum fresh weight yield as opposed to gas yield? So really what we're doing is to lock into the higher harvest index, the grains per ear of these newer hybrids, and it, it therefore makes direct sense to, um, to follow that trend, if you like, um, to really select something like Serafino and uh, newer products like that. With every new generation of hybrids, we can uh, raise this, this harvest index quite strongly. Ultimately, that would lead to higher yields. If you let the grains fill out, uh, you would also access the higher um, gas yield per tonne. Um, last question I'll directly answer first uh, is from Mark. How do you know uh, if rye straw compares with wheat straw for carrots? So, there's quite a lot of farmers, particularly in Norfolk, growing carrots uh, using rye straw, and um, that is uh, quite common practice. Um, rye straw is not as digestible as, as barley if you use it for livestock, um, but equally it's, uh, it's not um, a dusty straw, which is a concern for, for livestock as well. I think, no I think John, it's probably better to say it's, it's quite a tough straw, isn't it? I mean, it's it's more akin to wheat in terms of, as you said, for livestock, more of a bedding straw than a uh, an eating straw. So, you know, I think yeah, there, there's nothing we yeah. would see in terms of why it shouldn't replace wheat uh, straw for either bedding or carrots. Um, question from Tim Payne, which I'll pass to John and Kirsty. Um, to comment on is how long can you grow rye continuously? And I think for Kirsty, maybe to just touch a little bit on the ergot uh, legislation, um, just on that one. Yep, okay, I'll start with ergot then. If, um, so obviously, uh, all, all varieties are not the same, and John, you'll probably talk a bit more in the detail about pollen plus and, and what our varieties can offer in terms of ergot control. Um, from an end user perspective, yeah, it's well understood that ergot is one of those products that is uh, under the microscope, if you like, particularly when it comes to European legislation. We know that there is a lot of European legislation coming to fruition. Um, I think it's probably been delayed because of the recent COVID um, issues, but it's still on the agenda. I think for our, from our perspective, um, Let's see what happens at Brexit and what the UK take up as their stance. My understanding is they will follow the European directive and actually the levels for ergot um, tolerance, if you like, will come much further down in baked products. Um, but yes, as I said, all varieties aren't the same. So, John, perhaps you'll talk a bit about... Yeah, products. you're right. I mean, there's a, there's a variety angle. I think there's also a, an agronomic practice angle. Um, ergot obviously was with rye being quite an out-pollinated cereal compared to things like barley that seem to fertilize while they're still splitting boot. Um, yeah, ergot always was the problem. Now KWS, uh, going back quite a number of years, um, found a gene that created um, super pollination. So a, a, great, a, a large amount of pollen coming out and it's been termed pollen plus. Now Pollen Plus works in two ways. A, there's so much pollen coming out that the ergot can't get in, but also it creates a pollen cloud, and therefore uh, that's why I was looking at the impact of main tillers and back tillers, because within a hybrid crop you may have uh, ears where there is some sterility, and this cloud catches that. So it's this, it's not just the pollen coming out of an individual, it's this cloud that um, of pollen that can produce. So we, there are still the potential to create ergot, even within a pollen plus crop. And that would be because of back tillers uh, and having back tillers that are significantly late and miss the pollen cloud. So particularly growing for, growing for, for animal feed or human consumption, obviously ergot is, you know, it was a near zero tolerance. It, it's in even lower than zero tolerance now. Um, so we have to make sure we do everything to minimize that. So obviously it's pollen plus, 
for quite a number of people, John. I mean, you've you've obviously been out and seen a few more farms. You know, people are using spraying out wider tram lines. Um, I know with black grass competition, it's now more practice to drill your tram lines and then run them down during the spring. Of course, that's, you know, for a wheat crop, that might not matter. But for a rye crop, you are going to create back tillers. So whether you do that and then go through with a hooded sprayer and spray out your wheelings, or whether you actually leave wider wheelings uh, when you're drilling um, to stop any back tillers. But that is the only occasion <coughs> I've seen um, ergot in pollen plus. John, you, you've been out and seen a few more. What's your thoughts? Yeah, um, I would say that the gene is valuable, but of course it's, uh, it's like any trait in breeding. We, we want to take care of it. Um, and so <coughs> in practice, rye continuously, perhaps two is uh, stretching to three. One comment, uh, finally, I'd say, is we, we visited a rye vita grower who had rye for seven years. And, um, yeah, tremendous ergot problems there. So uh, I think that answers that one. Um, got two more questions which actually conveniently combine. So from Sarah, Symes has asked, uh, are any of the varieties more suited to heavier ground over lighter ground? And then James Thompson has asked, which variety would you put on low fertile soil? So sand or gravel for combining. So first of all, um, rye is definitely a lighter land crop. We definitely, we know that. Um, if you put it on heavy ground, uh, you can expose it to slug damage. Um, it then comes down to the speed of development. So some of the uh, hybrids we know, and John can sort of allude to this, I think, is are, are slower to grow stage 51. Others are actually more aggressive. Um, and there are certain biogas varieties as well, which are extremely fast, in fact, almost too, too much. Um, so Serafino is perhaps at the, at the faster end, but has the maximum yield potential. That would be best to put on really low fertile. Um, so you kind of use the, the speed of development to do the yield for you. Um, if you put... Uh, something like KWS Bono on, um, on heavier ground, we have seen it slower to develop and uh, means it won't get, um, won't get too frothy uh, and therefore doesn't, uh, you've lost the PGR um, window a little bit. So I, I hope that answers yeah, that. I'd, I'd agree, John. I think it's on the heavier ground, particularly, well, I think we lump heavier ground and perhaps fertility together you know, then the ability to stand is probably a bit like most other crops. The ability to stand becomes one of the, the key attributes for choosing. And you're right, you know, Bono is, is is one of the stiffest varieties out there. There's not that much between them, to be honest, uh, particularly, well, more so from our portfolio. I don't think there's that much between them. Um, when you go to, like, James's question with, with, you know, low fertility, proper sand and gravel, you know, um, then the, the, the environment is going to take a hell of a toll on them and will lower the fertility. So, yeah, I guess you're less worried about standing because they're going to take the sting out of them. Um, but I think ultimately, performance-wise, you know, the variety introductions, the new generations are, are you know, if you look at where we do our trials or where the descriptive list trials are done for, for NIAB, you know, there's probably bigger differences in newer generation material than, than 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 there is between sort of the bunch of new material we've got. So I think, uh, yeah, you're probably going to rely on a lot of the environment to take the sting out of anything on a low fertility site. But as you say, uh, it's about establishment and pure aggression through the season. And I think rye probably has it more in spades. But certainly Serafino is a variety that's you know, has impressed me and it's not, not, uh, not, you know, it's a bit, bit like Pro Power. It grows very aggressively, but it's not, uh, it's not as quite as beastly and as hard to manage. Okay, that's excellent. Um, we're now going to conclude the session. Firstly, by saying thank you to to everybody for attending. Um, you're most welcome. A copy of this session, uh, which has been recorded, will be available. Um, in, uh, in due course on, on the internet. 
And um, if you wish to have any further information uh, on Rye, uh, most of it's on our website, uh, and you're welcome to, uh, to contact us. It's also us. at the top so of the screen. There's some there links is, on the side. There is a final question. <laughs> You can download the <laughs> variety guide from us, which has all of the crops in it, and the hybrid rye guide is also there, and there's also links on the website to through Cereals 360, which is our virtual demonstration, and obviously, as John said, uh, any other stuff that you want to download, there's some links there. Cool. Thank you for listening, everybody. We had one oh. question come in, actually. Do you quickly come up to that one? Is Serafina okay for highly fertile sites? From Thomas Anderson. So I, I would say uh, you need to look at the, the, the nitrogen requirements of rye and we really we draw the line at sort of uh, 150 kilos of, of crop requirement. Um, if you get an SNS index in, in the spring uh, and work out quite how much uh, fertility you've got, um, as long as you, you don't have excessive amounts of nitrogen, then I think uh, the answer would be yes. Um, that's, I, I, that's I agree with you, John. I think you're right. Yeah, if you've got high fertility sites, Serafina is a top yielder, and it's and it's good and you know good and stiff. So yes, um, I think what John was alluding to, if you've got plenty of mineral N available, then you're going to have to apply less. So it's that calculation in terms of what's there. The other key thing that we've learned is is getting that ride going early doors. And if we do come out of a a cold winter, a wet winter. You know, uh, where people had gone wrong with rye was where they looked to use digestate entirely for the source of fertilizer. And of course, you can be quite late in the spring before big machines applying the stuff can travel. And thin crops that were, you know, looked at were largely based on the fact they hadn't had any nitrogen. So thinking about Tom's question in more detail, then, yeah, you could probably make big savings in fertilizer if you have a high fertility site. But don't just think about not putting anything on it. Because if there's not much mineralized, you want to make sure you maintain tillers. So it might be giving it a sniff of, you know, 25 to 35 kilos of nitrogen, uh, you know, as soon as we can in the spring uh, to really kick it on and then look that the site will supply. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, oh. There's another question here. So Go on. <laughs> coming in. I think uh, it's for you, JB. <laughs> yeah, Tim Payne is. Um, can't quite see that. Yet. Is Serafino available commercially? Is Serafino commercially available this year? I've had one merchant say that it isn't. It's a question from Tim Payne. Yeah, good question. So uh, Serafino very much is commercially available. Um, it's uh, that that's that answers the question. I think um, you're right. <laughs> It does. <laughs> Nigel's Nigel Nigel done. We're waiting. Come on, Nigel. <laughs> Speed it up. <laughs> Fast typing. <laughs> Available from Agrovision. Yeah, well, well done, Nigel. Top marks. <laughs> nice play. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to wrap it up there. Okay. I think that's it. But uh, thank you again, and we'll see you next time.